So welcome everybody. My name is Naomi Stead and I am Professor and Head of the Department of Architecture at Monash University. Uh, and this of course is a collaboration between Parla and Monash Department of Architecture. As always, we begin with acknowledgement of country. And on behalf of Parla, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country across Australia's many nations and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to elders past and present and to the indigenous Australians who are part of the Parla community. This, believe it or not, is the 27th in the series Light at the End of the Tunnel, which looks into architecture as a profession uh, and how it will not just survive the pandemic, but thrive and come out the other side with great, um, what's the word, alacrity, improvement, just general excellentness. Um, this week, our guests are Alison Mirams and Natalie Galia, speaking on the subject of changing culture, lessons from the construction industry. Justine will uh, properly introduce Natalie and Alison in a moment, but first, as always, some protocols for the session. Please make sure your microphone is on mute unless you're actually speaking. Uh, but we invite you to leave your camera on if you're willing and able uh, because we love to see your faces and there's more of a sense of community. As you know, the format is Q&A. It's meant to be informal but informative. Justine and I will ask questions and keep things flowing, but as always, we'll take questions from the floor throughout. So please put your questions in the chat. If we call upon you, then we will invite you to pose your question uh, live verbally. Uh, please also feel free to add your own observations and experiences into the chat. Um, Justine. Naomi, thank you. Okay, well, hi everybody. Um, very nice to see you all once again. Um, I have to say I'm very excited about this session. Um, Natalie and Alison are both total superstars and um, extremely, uh, you know, doing extraordinary work um, within the construction industry and also uh, very articulate about what and why. So, um, very, very excited. Um, Alison Mirrens is the CEO of Roberts Pizzarotti, which is a Sydney-based construction firm at the forefront of cultural and organisational change in the sector. She's a really strong advocate for women and she's uh, committed to improving mental health in an industry that is plagued by challenges. Um, one might say construction has even more problems than architecture in that regard. Um, I've heard Alison speak a few times and I've always been um, super impressed and I just feel like so often in architecture people kind of go oh it's the construction industry that's the problem um, and I think that that's kind of wrong and I think there's a lot that we can learn from construction and so I'm very happy uh, that Alison is here to share her extraordinary work with us and Alison often works with Natalie Galea who many of you know from our previous events Nat is um, a uh, former construction manager, current uh, researcher on uh, a range of topics, including gender equity in construction and also human rights and sport. Um, I'm just talking off the top of my head here, Nat, so if I get something wrong, please just <laughs> um, interject. But uh, Natalie's, part of Natalie's research work at the moment is conducting a study into the impacts of a program that Alison is running at the Concord Hospital. So. Uh, we thought really great to have both of them here to talk from those two different perspectives. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. We're ex delighted and excited to have you here. Um, Alison, I wonder if you could just start by telling us a little bit about Roberts Pizzerotti because I know we, you know, it's a newish company, construction company, and you had very particular aims when you set up that construction company. And I wonder if you wanted to just uh, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you for the invitation to be here with you today. Uh, and uh, it's an absolute pleasure to sit here uh, next to Matt. We are sitting side by side, we're in the same location. Um, so Robert's Pizzerotti was started uh, almost four years ago and I knew the Roberts family from my time at Multiplex. I was at the time at Len Lease and they rang me and said, we're going to start a new construction company and we want you to come and run it. Uh, we're going to give you a pile of money to get you started. We're going to give you a blank sheet of paper. And the mandate from the board was create the best construction company you can. And so the business plan is very simple. We want to be a catalyst for positive change. And we want to make the most of having a blank sheet of paper. Uh, and uh, we want to uh, fix the things that are wrong in the industry, the systemic issues in the industry, 
um, like mental health, like uh, female participation, giving people time back with their families. Um, and we've had the opportunity to put a lot of, uh, a lot of Nat's research into um, how we set up the company. And, and I think Nat's got a great quote that the construction industry is, is tough for men, but it's bloody tough for women. Uh, and with a blank sheet of paper, we've been able to try and address a whole lot of that. Okay, so um, Natalie, I wonder if you might chime in a little bit and talk about, um, I mean, we've had you talk before, um, but around the kinds of challenges, oh, look, this is you know, a huge question, but what are the very particular challenges in the, in, in the industry that, um, that you see that, that um, need, can be addressed through sort of structural change? Yeah, look, you know, when we, um, just to let you know, yes, Alison is, is coming through Natalie Galea in terms of sound. <laughs> we are um, beside each other and, um, you know, with Zoom, you get that terrible uh, reverberating echo. So in terms of um, our research that um, UNSW conducted um, from 2013 and we released findings in 2016 and then more detailed findings in 2018, I guess the headline finding was to increase the number of women in the construction sector, we have to be willing to challenge the working conditions of men. And um, what we found was that um, the initial research we did really looked at how and whether gender equality policies um, that construction companies were putting in place, how they were traveling and whether they were reaching construction sites. Um, and what we found was that in many cases that they weren't, that they were being either pushed out of the way by other formal rules like the contract or norms around how we work the six day or seven day week. Um, and then for women layered on top of that, so they, they had really gendered consequence for men, particularly around wellbeing. Construction has the second highest suicide rate of any sector in the country. Every second day, a construction worker takes their own life. And a young construction worker is six times more likely to kill themselves than die from a workplace accident. Um, and we also know from extensive research that others have done, Helen Lingard, um, Valerie Francis, that um, the other thing that we know about construction workers and the effect of these um, structures and work practices on um, construction workers is that we have um, poor wellbeing, um, high marriage breakdown, substance abuse, high substance abuse, and comparative to the um, general population, a higher degree of, um, uh, of physical ailments and injury. Um, for women, then, you layer a different, another layer on top of that, which is, you know, I guess this sort of double bind that many women find themselves in, in male-dominated sectors where the stereotypes, they're judged around the stereotypes of what it means to be a woman, woman in society, and yet um, when they try to act like a construction um, professional or seek the same, um, I guess, uh, degree of respect and authority, they're challenged on that because of some of the gendered um, stereotypes that women face. So women, we found women walked a really tight um, line between, and it was very tricky for them to fit in. And also we found that um, apart from the general sexism, which still occurs, um, the work practices, the construction, so I keep going back to that, the long work hours, the expectations that sites are set up on a six and increasingly seven day week, um, that has, for women, they're, they're put within this sort of very difficult situation where they're unable to um, conduct care responsibilities because they're wedged between an in, inflexible care roles and inflexible construction roles. So we've got Alison beside me now. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't, sorry. Yeah, so, um, so I just go back to those headline findings um, because I think it's really relevant despite all of the policies that companies we found were doing, which were very much focused on women and in a lot of cases fixing women and focusing on their ability to lead and all that type of thing. The headline finding was that if you want to shift gender equality in the construction sector, you actually have to look at how work is done on construction yeah. sites. Which is the perfect segue into um, the project that I suppose I've heard most about and I'm kind of completely fascinated by the Concord Hospital project. Um, and I wonder, Alison, if you might talk to us a little bit about how you've set that up um, 
and and how you did that i know that it was i think you submitted a non-conforming bid which i think is again something uh we might learn more about in the um in in the world of architecture that we may sometimes put forward an alternative approach that um and that that can be successful so i wonder if you could tell us a bit about concord and how you're running it yeah, what we did, when we put the tender together, we, we put in a conforming tender as you need to in government tenders. And we also put in a non-conforming tender and it was a non-conforming program. And we said to Health Infrastructure in Black Ink, uh, a construction worker is six times more likely to die from suicide than a workplace accident. So we proposed to, um, build the project five days a week. And we said, you as you of all people can't allow someone to die building a hospital that is being built to make people better. And they said, yeah, you're right. And they said to me, how much will it cost? And I said, too scared to ask, I don't know, but I can find out. And so we went and asked all of our subcontractors and they said, do you want a cost saving or a cost increase? And I said, I want neither. If it's gonna save you money, you can keep it. And the reality from the subcontractors was there was no extra cost. Our program extended by 10 weeks. And if I just took Saturday out of the program, it extended it by four months. We then said we can do some activities between three and five in the afternoon. And that will, um, that then reduce the program from overrun from four months to 10 weeks. And we said to Health Infrastructure, the cost of our time for that 10 weeks was just over $2 million, which was 1.2% of the cost. Now, what we are seeing on site is actually increased productivity. And I don't think we'll use the extra 10 weeks of time. So it's not a linear argument to say that I've taken a Saturday out, so therefore I have to add more time because we are, and, and that would be right if construction workers were fully productive every minute of every day, but we all know they're not. And so we're getting more productivity and it's a very simple equation to think about. If you think about working women who have returned from maternity leave, they are far more efficient than they were pre-maternity leave as a generalization. I know I am. Uh, before Matt was born, I'd sit at the lunch table for an hour and a half and I'd talk I don't do that anymore. I know I get in at quarter to nine. I have to leave at five to get to pick up. But I still get all my work done in the same in that period. So I'm actually working less hours, but doing the same amount of work. And you're putting that logic into a construction worker. And what we're seeing is the guys and girls on site are doing 50 to 52 hours a week. On our other sites, they're doing 56, 58, 60, 65. So they're actually earning less money, but they're doing the cost benefit analysis to say, I've got a better life and I can see my children and I can spend time with my partner. I've got time for sport. I'm taking my kids to sport. We've got a, a, a young lady who works for us on Concord Hospital who plays professionally for the Bulldogs. She can still play professionally for the Bulldogs because she doesn't have to work Saturdays. Normally the construction industry excludes you from playing sport, professional sport, any sport, social sport. Um, so it's having, a, it's having a really, really positive impact. Hmm. Naomi, I feel like I'm hogging the questions. Would you like to? Um, no, no, keep going, Justine. Um, I did have a question, but it's just gone straight out of my head. So you, or you ask another question, and I'll try and remember what it was. Well, I mean, I mean, I was going to ask about the outcomes, which I know and how it's going so far, which you've kind of started to answer already. Um, Nat, I wonder if you, how are you, um, do you want to tell us about how you're um, uh, conducting a kind of analysis and research on this? And, and do you have, are you doing that in a kind of, do you have, do you have preliminary things you can share with us? Or, or, or how, do you, how do you do this sort of research while the project's in process? Yeah, so um, the research, so there has been research done in the past around five days, mostly in the game, discovery, how long can you get? But it was um, done post hoc. And so this is the first time that the research has been done in situ. Uh, we're using X methods. So we're using um, surveying, we're surveying workers um, every four months on the job, and which is tricky in construction. And construction, 
gives lots of challenges to researchers because it's, you know, you, you have workers flow in and out. Some trades stay for longer, some like concreters come and go. Um, but effectively we're, we're surveying them um, every four months and we're surveying them in relation to a few core things. We're using um, the K10, which is if any of you've gone to the doctors for a mental health plan, that's what they use there. We're asking them really direct questions around, you know, what, what do you prefer? How many hours? Is this, is this an issue? Like, what do you want to, what money do you want to earn? Because as Alison said, from the interviews, which is the other thing, there, I think there will be a sweet spot around um, the hours people want to work. Um, we're asking them about life satisfaction and um, we're also then asking them, do they want to do an interview so we can get some really, um, some qualitative data and, and that really just elaborates and provides us with, I guess, the narratives and stories to really reinforce some of the points. The other thing we're doing is for the first time, we're interviewing, uh, we're surveying and interviewing in sort of partners, construction workers, and no one's ever done that. Um, and that's been fascinating. Um, and um, again, we're doing two interviews with Next of Kin, where with workers, we're really only doing one. So we tried to capture when it first happened and then, you know, in the middle or as the leaving site, because there is quite a bit of anxiety about people moving off a five day work week back to the norm of a six day week. We're also collecting data on um, and doing a cost benefit analysis through one of my um, colleagues, um, Associate Professor Anurag Sherma, and he's doing, um, an analysis using the cost of the job, um, completion dates, but also calculating as health economists do, um, some of that sort of K10 and Hilda data, um, so that we can also, um, I guess, give an economic value to this. And there's great interest in that from, um, I know the broader sector around that sort of economic value. So at present, we've conducted most of the interviews. Um, we're just about to start probably our second third round of um, surveys with workers. And you would think people would just respond to an app, they don't. It requires myself and my team to go out and cook bacon egg rolls for workforce to entice them to complete the survey. Um, and we also have done, as I said, most of the interviews. So some preliminary um, findings, which Alison sort of um, touched on, is that there is I think, a sweet spot, particularly for the workers, around hours that they, it's, I find this fascinating. They're really um, interested in their, um, their children's life and wanting to be part of their children's life on a weekend. Um, probably if I could say more so than the relationship they have with their partners. So it kind of is an interesting feel around the entrenched nature of gender roles. Um, the other thing I would say is that they do do that cost benefit analysis and you can hear it in the, um, interviews in a way they they know exactly how much money they're losing. This is the blue collar workers, white collar workers are on contracts. So they are expected, you know, their times, um, they're not paid on an hourly rate. Um, from the, uh, the next of kin, the findings have been really interesting. Like, uh, I never realized how much construction work affected. I knew how much it affected women in construction, but I didn't realize how much it affected the partners of construction workers, and we found that um, those women, their lives and their economic security is constrained by construction work because they are the parents, they're the, the one that is relied upon for the flexibility. So that in real, in, in example, would mean that they can't take a promotion that might mean their hours stretch out or that they, you know, they have to think really carefully about the geography, the location of their work, because their partner's moving around, you know, the city doing work. Um, so the impact of construction work on women indirectly is incredible. Um, and I think it'll be one of the core findings from this. The other thing I'll say is just the travel time that people are expected to work now in these really built up cities like Sydney, um, is, you know, there's some workers that get on a train at 3 a.m. in the morning to be on site, um, apprentices who start at 4 a.m. on public transport, and they were doing this through COVID. Um, and the other thing is some of the, the effects, you know, the workers particularly report around being less short and um, tired with their family. Um, and I think that's really important, like that they actually have time to actually be 
present and be with their family when they're doing these hours um, and take them off Saturday because not working Saturday takes away from, you know, another day of um, travelling really long hours to site. So interestingly, I mean, I think with research anyway, you often do get people who speak up who want to be, um, want their voices heard. So, you know, there is some, to a degree, some bias, but what we've overwhelmingly heard is a lot of people come forward and say, I was against this when I started and now I'm an absolute, you know, I'm for it. And a lot of fear and anxiety about moving on to the next six day and seven day job because they've tasted what it's like to work five days. So that's sort of just a snapshot. We'll have an interim report end of Q1 next year, which will take some of the quantitative data and we'll have really, you know, gone around and um, gone looked at coded properly, the qualitative, we're doing that now. And then the final report will be probably around August, September next year when the site finishes. And just to add, we, because of COVID, we added, had to add a control site. So we have had a control site that we've been collecting data from. It's a six day week site. And so we'll use that as well as our control site to see that some of the mental health issues um, or, or um, results haven't been affected by COVID as opposed to working on site. Mm. I was going to ask, um, sorry, then, no, it's a, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, keep going. The, the people, the, the side that really got me was the part that was saying, I was drawn from the workforce because my husband, I can't rely on him at all for anything to do with kids. And mm. so, They've withdrawn from the workforce, and if their husband's left them, they've got nothing. They've got no super. They're they're, they're on their own. Construction industry is the third largest employer in the country. So not only are we bad at bringing women into the industry, we are actually stopping women from working in society in general. And and one of the our union delegate at Concord, uh, I said to him, "What do you think about working five days a week?" And his face lit up and, and this is a real union guy. And I said to him, he said, I love it. And I said, why? He said, I've got a 13 month old son. My wife's a hairdresser. She works Saturdays and I spend every Saturday just me and my son together. Like, that just gives me goosebumps. Um, and to Nat's point, when we started, there were a lot of people that said, yeah, maybe. The union said, look, if you want to do it, we'll let you do it on one site. And when we started negotiating our EBA, they said, yeah, no, we're not interested in talking about a five day calendar permanently. Fast forward 12 months, they've heard all the feedback out of Concord from their members. They have now become the greatest advocates of the five day week. And in the EBA we just signed, I have a Monday to Friday calendar that we can use on every project moving forward. Now, if the union can change their tune, the rest of the industry can as well. And I take my hat off to the union because they listened to the feedback, they heard it, they listened to it, they actioned it, and they're absolute advocates for it. Hmm. I was just going to ask about, in fact, you've sort of more or less answered the question, but it was about, um, uh, you know, whether whether the people that you're talking to, whether the workers on the site are actually seeing this as a kind of, as part, possibly part of long-term structural change. Like, are they seeing them, you know, are they kind of willing this experiment to succeed because they want it to be perpetuated and expanded and, and made permanent? Do you see what I mean? Like, is that, you know, are they being more efficient yeah. also because they're, they're, you know, all right on board? Yeah, I, I would say that, um, so to answer that, yes. And I think there would have been a lot of people that started the, on the site who weren't for this, but increasingly because they've had the lived experience they are. Um, I would also say that it's more complex that some subcontractors, because of the very nature of their work, they don't um, seek get the same benefits, like concreters, for example, where they're coming here, pouring a slab and going to another site. So it's really important that for this structural change to happen, it does have a wholesale shift across the sector. Um, and then I'm just trying to think of my the point I was going to make to you about, and I've completely lost my um, thought <laughs> about the other component around, um, <laughs> yeah, but anyway, yes, I think that they have, I think that um, they are willing it. Oh, and just, I guess the great anxiety, we because we asked them about, you know, we asked them if they're, when they're moving on to the next site, how are you feeling about that? And they are anxious because, you know, there are, you know, real humans that, um, 
behind these these interviews and some of them you know have when you ask particularly the next of kin they're much more forthcoming probably than the the construction workers but they reveal a lot of um issues within their personal life associated with the constraints of work have put on their their relationships with each other and so it's almost you know, this type of shift has given them breathing space. Um, so I do think that they, you know, and just even by the shift by the union to sort of take that up. Um, and the union had a different perspective. They're going to give them not a do a five day work week, but do every second Monday as a fixed RDO. Mm -hmm. So they've made change there. So, I mean, you know, their workforce is telling them what, you know, that they want that shift. Mm -hmm. So for every eight years I work on a five-day site, I get one year back with my family. An entire year of time with your family for every eight years of work. Hmm. <laughs> yes. So, um, look, actually, we've got a question here from, um, or a comment, really, from Christine. Christine, do you want to um, add your voice to the conversation? Are you there? Can I just, uh, before you get Christine on, I just wanted to say, remember what I was going to say in the interviews, and it'll be really interesting to see how this comes out after we've codified it, but um, what we are hearing is that because there isn't a six day and the site is shut, that the planning that goes into, Alison's point a bit about being a, a mother, but the planning that goes into the week because it's not that carryover day that they've just all become used to, that they actually um, said that the site is really well managed and planned. Um, they will do the occasional, they have to lift the crane in and out, for instance, they might do that on a Saturday, but otherwise it's shut for everybody. So the degree of um, organisation on the site has been really heightened um, in COVID. The site in particular got, you know, rave reviews because obviously they had to um, operate and put more site sheds in, etc. Um, and to your point, Kim, yes, the other control site is a um, an RP site because we needed to have um, access pretty quickly when COVID hit because we thought, oh my gosh, what are we going to do with this um, research? Will it be the end of it? So we were able to shift and, and we used another site, an RP site, um, to collect that data. So, it, I mean, it, it, it sounds like it's kind of Deliver, to a certain extent, it's delivering as as you expected. Um, but I'm also interested to know if what and Annette, you've talked, to, you've both spoken actually about the the uh, the kind of surprise of realizing the extent of impact on um, on family and, and kin. But are there other surprises that that um, other things that have sort of surprised you that haven't quite gone as you anticipated when you set out to do this? Mm -hmm. I don't think there's I don't think there's any negatives to the five day week at all. And right. the business, we won't go backwards. Uh, we won't go back to six. Uh, interestingly, uh, construction people are very good at solving a problem. And a lot of people will say you can't do six five days a week because if you're crying on Friday, you've got to stress on Saturday. We don't. We've just put more Rio in the top of the deck and it controls the shrinkage cracking and we stress on Monday. So if you have the mindset of, I can't get there on those two days, how do I keep building so that I don't stop? Um, you solve the problem. And what we have actually seen is increased productivity from the workers because they know they've got two days off. So I think we had 44 slab pours and we only did four of them on a Monday. The rest of them were all done Tuesday to Friday. And what we found was the Rio fixers would say to us, you're pouring on, on Friday. And we'd say, the deck's not ready. And they'd say, book the concrete, you're pouring. We'll do the time, you get us, you you just pour, we'll get you there. Uh, and so the, the subcontractors started to drive program because they could see they were getting two days off. They've also said, I feel like a new person. And I, and I challenge all of you to tell me how good you feel on a mon on a Tuesday after a long weekend. You feel amazing. That is what we are doing to construction workers every weekend. An extra Saturday is, is uh, an equivalent of six weeks leave per annum. And, and all the people, I've had a whole lot of contractors to 
competitor's saying to me, it won't work. You're adding time to program. You're only adding time to program if, um, if everyone was efficient every minute of every hour and they're not. Yeah. And we need to measure, we need to stop looking at presenteeism and say, okay, by the end of the week, I need this done. So tell people on Monday where they need to be on Friday, let them make their own decisions on how they do that. But also now think about how good the project manager and the architect and the engineer feels on Monday. Saturday is the day that the builders catch up on paperwork. So you walk in on a Monday morning and you've got a barrage of emails from an angry builder. That's unpleasant. And, and that's not a nice way to start your week. You know, you walk in on a Monday morning, it's like, oh, we don't have that Saturday catch up day anymore. So it means paperwork done, it gets done all throughout the, the week. And suddenly we're now on the same program cycle as the consultants. And I know a lot of consultants are saying it's actually taken a whole lot of pressure off them because we're not in there on a Saturday trying to drive and trying to push, but we're still maintaining the productivity. And our programmer said to me yesterday, the productivity I am looking at is a six day productivity without us doing anything. Now, if you think about, um, I, I assume a lot of you are based in Melbourne, but last weekend it was really hot in Sydney. And at 11 o'clock on Saturday, it hit 35 degrees where they go home or they relocate to cooler areas. To Nat's point, the people that got up at three o'clock or four o'clock to catch a train, at 11 o'clock were turning around and going home. At Concord, they didn't come in. They came in on Monday, skipping in through the gate because it had a beautiful weekend. So they feel really, they feel respected. They feel valued. If they get that, then you get better quality. You get better safety. You don't get damage on sites. Like it's a very, very simple equation. It's enormously frustrating to me that so many more people don't just get it um, because it's not rocket science. It's really basic. And it's unfortunately the people that are working five days a week at the top of organisations saying, no, no, you should work six. We are seeing so many more women come to us. We are seeing it's the biggest recruitment tool I could have as a business because people are saying, I want to work for you because I love how you set up the company. I love how you're, you're treating your staff. Um, a, a third of our team at Concord are females. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing I will say in our EBA, we agreed with the unions that instead of having the fixed start time at 7am in the morning and if it's after that it's shift work, considered shift work and it's double time, people can now start anywhere between 6am and 8.30 in the morning and that's to try and get dads to do drop off and try and get dads to be able to participate in their lives, in the lives of their children and take some pressure off their partners so their partners can go to work. Because what we've found is partners are saying, I've got the lion's share of the kids, but I've got them Monday to Sunday. Because when he comes home on a Saturday, he says, Sunday's my day to rest. You've still got the kids. Mm -hmm. And it was really highlighted for me early, early on in the first six months of setting up the company. My project manager, uh, one of the project managers went home early. Early, it was 4.30 or 5, but for him, that was early. And he got home in time to do bath and books for his twin boys. And one of them looked at him and he, and he said, Daddy, is it soccer tomorrow? And Damien said to him, no, no, it's Tuesday. It's kindy. And his boy said to him, but Daddy, when you're home, we go to soccer the next day. Because the night he's home is Saturday. He doesn't see his kids Monday to Saturday. That's not good for any child. You know, if you have two parents in your life, you should have two parents in your life. You shouldn't be reliant on one. I wonder if we might um, go back to Christine, who I think has, um, is now ready. Christine, do you want to make your point? Hello. Yes. Hi. I've, um, it's wonderful to hear you saying all these things, Alison, and I really, really hope that you can push this through. You know, the leaders in, the, um, um, in our industry, and the master builders and the rest of them, So, because it really does start from the top. Because as we know, the subbies are under incredible pressure to perform. They have to perform for a certain amount of money and there's all this time. I have been married for 20 years to a builder. Uh, I might as well have been a single mum and I've said it many times. When, when we would have our arguments, I'd say the only reason why I'm married to you is for the money and nothing else because you're never home. Um, no afternoon activities, no weekend by Sunday, exhausted, there's no family time. It's, it's, it's um, very difficult, the stresses that you've mentioned, 
the mental, the mental stresses, the physical ailments, not kicking a football. Um, people underestimate how much the construction industry demands of its workers. And uh, it's, I kin it to slavery, really. Um, yep. And I'd really like to see it change because it has to start from the top. It, your subbies need to earn money and they'll do whatever they can to get it. And if we as architects did what they did, we'd be up in, you know, we'd be outraged. And for me, my personal career, I haven't been able to work because someone had to pick up kids. Yep. Mm. What happens? It's been a real difficult challenge. I'm, I'm, I'm not the only one that goes through it, no doubt. Thank you to me when modern slavery came in. The modern slavery legislation came in and everyone looked through their supply chain for overseas. But as you rightly point out, what is the difference between flogging a construction worker 60, 70, 80 hours a week and having the coffee picker in Sri Lanka on $2 an hour. It is the same. And people need to look within their organisations and see the conditions and how they're treating their people uh, and the hours they're expecting them to do because it is wrong. Mm. So with COVID, there was that wonderful um, that, um, statement that came out from the New South Wales government that workers could work extended hours in residential areas so they could now work till 10 p.m and they could start early on the sunday and the idea of that was to drive the um, the rostering of staff to make it COVID safe and all that sort of thing all it did and my husband works for a very large construction company in melbourne all that did was make him start work at 6 30 and they had to work till 10 o'clock at night six days a week and come in on a Sunday to be able to get the deadline done to meet it in case they had to shut down. Didn't mean more people on site, didn't mean any of that. It meant more work with one lunch break of 30 minutes and that's it. Yeah. Mm. Well, I, I, I said that to a few politicians and I said, I really wish you hadn't done it because the only people who benefited from it were builders who were already behind programs. We didn't increase any of our hours um, and we didn't ask anyone to work any, any longer. It also mm. just reinforced what, what I, I found in my research was just a lack of sophistication around human resources and jobs for projects, particularly by what the white collars were calling. Um, there was no real science behind how they came in and reduced their jobs. Maybe some, you know, old construction manager out the back sort of did a bit of this kind of same square meter each job and we'll just throw the same people on, but then we'll steal them away just before the end and everybody will work more. Um, Justine, to your question, if I can just say the things that have shocked me a bit, um, is the resistance by, um, I'm going to be blunt, men, at, men both on site and in the top, and I would say older men, I was anecdotally on site making bacon and egg rolls, as you do, and um, feeding uh, um, workers as they were um, asked to sort of do the survey. And um, older sort of guys in there, I'd say, you know, over 50. So this is anecdotal. It's not, um, you know, from the data, but basically said, oh, you know, these blokes, you know, they have to work extra hours and do over time because they, they're saving for mortgage. And then also once they get the mortgage, they need to pay it off quickly. And, straight away I was like do you have to do that do you like I had no idea about that rule anyway I was just going to have a mortgage and um <laughs> and so I walked down to the other end of the table where these young younger men new younger fathers were and expecting them to just reinforce what I'd heard up the other end and I said so what are you guys how are you finding it and the first guy said to me I love it. I get to take my daughters to ballet on a Saturday. Well, you could have, you know, I was floored by his response as well because it was so, because I was expecting a completely gender, different gender example. Um, and the other thing I'll say is the resistance within the sector mm -hmm. from senior men who tell me that you can't do it, this is crap, blah, 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 blah. But what I don't see is any other alternative. And quite frankly, if companies are serious about gender equality, they're tinkering at the edges if they are not addressing the structural elements of how they deliver their projects you know they that is the thing that they can control the bread and butter and I know it's hard and it's competitive but 
quite frankly, you know, that is the that is the fundamental area where they can have the biggest impact, um, both in so many areas on men's well-being, but on the retention of, of women as well. I mean, you know, um, and I would go as far. I'd probably be a bit. Um, I, I think the five-day work week is a step in the right direction. The next we have to do is look at work hours because work hours as um, I think the one I can't remember her surname from ANU. You know. A, she has done such extensive research in work hours and the impact it has on men and women and, and older workers. So I think that this is a step forward. And whilst it doesn't address what we often see in white collar work, workplaces where we ask for flexibility, um, this is sort of a way of shifting some of those um, normative barriers that I think have been put in place. And they're written in contracts now too, to really shift the construction um, sector forward. So what resistance have you seen, Alison? Have you seen other other kinds of resistance as well? Or? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us some war stories. <laughs> I, I had a conversation with one of the major builders in Sydney yesterday and he said to me, I said to him, why are you against the five-day week? And he said, because it's simple maths. You've got 284 working days in a year, 48 are Saturdays. If you take 48 out, you, you'll extend your program by 16%. And I said, no, because you're more efficient. He said, you can't be. I said, are you more product? Are you telling me that every man is productive every minute of every day? And he said, I don't know. I haven't done a productivity survey. I said, come on, you walk around sites, you can see it. And he said, you will never ever convince me that you can be more efficient. And I said to him, he said, I'll build six days a week, you build five and I'll beat you every, day, every time. But at what cost? So you can't, this is what I'm up against with people saying, no, you can't do it. Of course you can do it. When people say to me, it'll add time. I don't think it will, but if it does, development takes four or five years to get to completion from when the initial concept, from when the site is bought. If you can't find four or five weeks in four, in four or five years, you're not trying. And then the other thing they say to me is, oh yeah, but at the back end of the job, you have to work six or seven days a week. Well, we just handed over Zurich Tower in North Sydney five weeks early without working seven days a week. And I think what we, what we have done as a business is we've really focused on having great design managers. And our design managers are very experienced. I've seen our executive design managers are in their mid to late 40s. And what that has meant is that we're getting design resolved when we need it. So when we're digging the hole, we want the pile set out drawings, we want the pad footings, we want the concrete drawings. I don't want the vinyl color or the paint color. And so when we went into COVID, all of our jobs are at least 85% procured and we didn't get a delay in the supply chain because everyone had a lot of time. Now, if, if, as you know, you can't build if you can't procure and you can't procure if you can't design. So if we now change the focus out of construction and we put the focus in design up front and we get the design right and then we procure and we don't lose time in the front end of the program, then you don't have to find it in the back end of the program. And that's what we're trying to do. And it's, it's interesting, it's not a silver bullet that fixes the industry. It is a sum of a lot of low hanging fruit. And we've got the benefit of being able to do it all at the same time because we started from scratch. We started with nothing. Everything you see and touch in your day, we did not have, we had to build. So we've been able to say, okay, what's the best thing to do at every point in time? And that's how we've been able to make the change. Um, but it is just this fixed mindset of, you can't do it. That's the way we've always done it. And that's what we have to do. And we have to stop looking at just program because the cost of program is enormous. If I walked in and said, my tender's $100 million, it'll take 24 months and I'll kill two people. The client wouldn't accept it. And they'd be like, they'd be mortified. That is the reality of what the industry is doing. But sadly, if you're a suicide, you're not a statistic. And if you're a fatality, you're not a statistic. A fatality is not an LTI. You sadly just disappear. So there's no trace. 
And when there's no trace, there's no accountability. When there's no accountability, there's no need to change. <laughs> so well, I was going to ask a question about um, strategies for advocacy, but I think we've just seen a kind of masterclass of that right now, because <laughs> I guess your, um, your, let's say, rhetorical strategies, which are based on, you know, facts, telling the hard facts very directly, which it seems to me to be extremely convincing, um, is, is in itself a kind of mode of, uh, you know, like a strategy for advocacy. And what other kinds of strategies do you use to try and bring around these people and overcome their resistance? Right. One thing we do, do we have done in the past is also um, different parts of the, of the supply chain or the life cycle of construction. So, um, like, Alison's done a great job in educating a client, and that's, we've seen that in Concord. Um, we also um, run it up to the union and sort of suggested to them a few very basic clauses to put into their EBA, like safe and secure toilets for women. And, you know, now I would extend that to non-binary people. Um, safe and secure double entry block showers because from our research we found you know a great deal of sexual harassment through that um, a breastfeeding room um, the two-day removal of sexist graffiti on site um, oh yeah and then we also that was the union so we just said to them hi got a few suggestions lovely to meet you see you later and they we, you know you own that and then we went to the Green Building Council, Council and we also wrote them um, and we got the Construction Industry Cultural Task Force, which is a New South Wales, Victoria and increasingly Queensland date driven um, group and wrote a proposal to them to count social sustainability. So to Alison's point, you know, the human cost or the, the humans doing the building because that, that never counted that. Like it was always about the humans moving into the building but you could have killed two people on that job and, you know, you've got a, good, a star or whatever, I'm not over you, the green star. But so they've now, that shifted and now, you know, you would not believe the resistance even to requirements of having women's toilets on site, you know. Um, so they've now embedded that into their new green star rating tool. Um, yeah, so I guess for us, it's working at all different areas of, and trying to influence and and all different areas of the, the life, built environment life cycle and collaborating with people, um, you know, getting them on board. Yeah. Yeah. Because then it's not Matt and I saying it, it's in, it's in legislation, you have to do it. Um, yeah. the, the cultural task force that, that I've sat on for the past two years and Natalie's joined as an academic, it is, it is coming that uh, the task force is about improving the culture and the diversity of the industry and it will be a culture standard that says there's a time for life. We want jobs to be five days a week. We want people to work less than 50 hours. We want people to put the health back in WHS. In Metro, they have a really good saying that people shout safety, but they whisper health uh, and to increase diversity in the industry. Now that culture standard is coming. It might be a year away, uh, but we got on board really early because we were small enough and we started to implement all the changes. The other thing that we've done for women, and every business should do this, is when we have employed women, we have said, what's your salary? And they tell me it might be a hundred grand and we say, okay, that's nice. Most companies would then say, I'll pay you 110 or 115 and, and the person says, great, that's awesome. Thank you so much, where do I sign? We have employed into bands. So if they're on 100, but their band was 140, we said, that's nice, you're on 140. And they, they're blown away and they say, oh my God, it's so much money. But it's what they're worth. Now I could have saved a lot of money on our salary bill if I had no moral compass. But I do have a moral compass and we have done the right thing. Sadly, 25% of the women we employed needed their salaries fixed. Not one man needed his salaries fixed, and in some cases we brought them down. Women won the right for equal pay in 1970s, 1980s, but they are still underpaid. Mm -hmm. And so we've done the right thing to say, no, this is the ban, this is where we're going to employ you to. Mm. Yes, as you say, it, it requires um, change 
from many directions and, and certainly that's been our approach too. I was waiting for an architect in our audience to um, uh, it, make a comment around the focus on design issue because obviously that's very dear to all of our hearts. So Marika, I wonder if you would like to um, uh, join, the, join the conversation and I know that you're also interested in um, non-conforming bids and the possibilities, but would you like to talk about that focus on design question? Um, I think there's, I don't think there's very much to say except that um, I think all of this relates strongly from the architect's point of view with the pressures on the project in the earlier stages before it gets to construction and they're very, very interlinked um, because one of the really highly stressful parts of the project is when you start on site and the drawings aren't coordinated and you can't do, you, you just can't even do that um, concrete drawing because in fact, all the mechanical and, you know, structural and everyone's just all up in the air. It's, it's not actually a, a full project. And I think that's, to me, I don't know, but I think it's about the client. So, you know, to have this um, hospital client is fantastic, but it's not every project. <laughs> And I wonder, moving from here, um, what kind of projects are going to be able to get this uh, type of convincing? What, what kind of clients are going to be convinced to, to do this? I, I'm very excited about it. Greenstar, when it first came in, everyone said, it's rubbish, it won't work, it's going to cost more money, you won't get increased rents, it won't work. And one or two of the big REITs got on board and grandstanded and said, I'm going to change my whole portfolio. And it took off and Greenstar is now business as usual. And I think we need to find one or two clients who are happy to say, I have a sustainability policy. I have a diversity policy, I have an inclusion policy and I'm focused on safety. If you have all of those things, you can't ignore this. And I also, uh, my next uh, port of call is the male champions of change. They all, they all work in organisations that hand out work. Well, if you hand out work, and we know from the research that we are stopping women from entering society, you actually need to change. And there is so much inefficiency through the entire supply chain. And Marika, to your point, there is inefficiency in design because you get you go through optionitis at the start, the client's not clear. I know I've had a client before, he said to me, What I want, I want, I want what 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 I really want, you know what I want. And I said, No, the C and D and C doesn't stand for clairvoyant. You need to write it down. You if you can't write it down, I can't build it. Um, so we need to get very clear briefs up front, get the contractors in at the right time, get the subcontractors in at the right time. Again, it's not hard, it's not rocket science, but it's setting it out and stopping the waste. If we stop the waste, we will actually get projects delivered more efficiently um, in a shorter duration with better quality time for people and their families. Yeah, yeah. Justine, we've got, we've got three minutes remaining. Do you want to kind of ask a last question, Justine? Well, I actually wondered if we might go to Graham Barr because, of course, one of the reasons we're interested in having, um, having Nat and Alison here is, is the industry, the problem challenges we face in our own industry and particularly around ours. So, Graham, do you want to, you've raised that in the chat, would you like to make your comment? Well, I'm sorry, I'm not used to this sort of format, but I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's just that architects are expected often to work very long hours. They, they have to start off and at you know, 7.30 in the morning and then they have to work through till 7 at night. And um, the strain on their families and themselves is very unrealistic and very harmful to good work and to their own health. So uh, I think we really need to assess our culture of uh, working all night and artists in the garret and, you know, trying to come up with things when you're absolutely dog tired. 
when I started in um, 1981 as an architect, I would work every day of the week and I'd work 10 hours a day. And I found that I just got very tired and I had a bit of a breakdown and so I had to reassess my hours. And then I found by working more of a regular uh, work period, I would um, be more productive and produce better work. And I think the same thing can happen at university. I think that's where it should all start, that um, teachers should point out that, you know, it's the continual working through something on a, on a, a, a good timetable that gets the good, uh, good work, um, not working all the time. And, uh, because it's, it's that sort of quiet time when you get time to reflect that you often come up with your best work, your best designs. So I really think the whole work for architects needs to be reassessed. My daughter's an architect too, and she has to work very long hours for a big firm. And uh, I know it's very harmful on her health and uh, on her work, really. Mm. I hope she's not here. <laughs> we agree, Graham. Well, she knows who dad cares. <laughs> Anyway, that's uh, what it made me think. I think builders should be able to work a reasonable uh, work program as well, and they'll do better work and um, probably restore more confidence in their uh, trades person like approach to everything. And um, yeah, I think we, we just need better contracts for everybody. Better procurement, better contracts. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Alison, you were. Sorry. Felt a disservice over time of lowering the fees as well. Um, and my advice to you would be don't. Uh, I used to be a contracts administrator on site when I started in the industry, and I'd say to a subby, Can I have a cheaper price? And they'd say yes. And I used to think, What would I do if they said no? I would just take the number I had. Um, and I think fees have been squeezed so tightly, and construction margins so tightly, and the risk profile is just getting worse that it forces very bad behaviour. Um, I know when we wrote our contracts, we wrote them from scratch. The biggest contract I have with our supply chain is 24 pages. Our consultant agreement is 16. And it says in black ink, we will be fair and reasonable. Um, and, and I just do an experiment for the next week. Every time you talk to a builder, say to them, how are you? I will guarantee you 90% of the time, the answer will be, I'm so busy. To which I say, I didn't ask you how work was, I asked you how you are. We have to stop people from wearing I'm busy as a badge of honour because it's not. And I, and I think you just need to keep pushing back the whole time. I have an agreement with our lawyers, uh, Norton Rose, when I ask them to do something, if I don't tell them when I need it, they have to tell me when they can return it. Because the instant assumption is I want it tomorrow and I don't want it tomorrow. So I always say, can I have it? can you get this done in a week if you can't can you tell me when and I think you need to keep pushing back to say do you know when do you need this I can get this done by then is that acceptable to you because quite often we're in this habit of just returning straight away without asking and, and we need to bring the conversation up to say actually I've got an issue with that time frame can I give it to you a day later a week later because quite often the answer is yes um, but just be brave enough to have the conversation. And the more we have it, it's not a hard conversation. Exactly. Long hours, fee cutting, all of our favourite topics here. And it's really, really great to hear um, a perspective from the other side. And it's fant I mean, I just find it so invigorating to see the kind of very real change that you're making, which is why I wanted to share, share that with, with the parlor audience. Um, but we are now out of time. So I think we do a little virtual clap to say thank you very, very much. Um, I think there's a lot of lessons uh, that we might take away and a lot of ways in which our industries might work together. So um, thank you very much. Um, in terms of Parlour, we have our next, um, our next events coming up on Monday. So we don't, you know, we're not over the weekend, but straight over into the next day, which is the third in our Parlour Lab sessions. Uh, which is looking at um, trying to build stronger relationships between research and um, the practice community. So we have uh, Michaela Prescott um, from Namie's colleague from RISE 
And goodness me, I'm just checking my notes here. Uh, somebody talking about the Gold Coast. Uh, Heather Shearer talking about work on the Gold Coast. So looking at interdisciplinary work. Um, uh, so I think that will be really great. Again, it's a lunchtime thing, so just pop in for an hour. Um, and we've got, we're running right to the end of the year with the light at the end of the tunnel sessions. And so the, the, and the, like this one, the next two are also focusing on how we might ad advocate for change. Um, next week we have uh, Greta and Joe from Hassel talking about the work that they have been doing as um, employees in advocating for women and equity within the practice. That's been going on for quite some time. And um, so what we're really interested in there is how one might make, you don't need to be a director to make change, how you might make change from the kind of bottom up as well as the top down. And then the following week, we have our good friend Tanya Davidge coming along to talk about being a citizen architect, advocacy in the wider public realm. And she's joined by Colleen Peterson, who is a planner, who is also uh, very active in advocating for um, better practices, codes, et cetera, more broadly. So we're looking, so the first session, looking at how we'd make change from within. Next session, looking at how we make change in that kind of wider community as citizens, as well as professionals. So um, thank you again, Alison and, and um, Nat. That was really, really fantastic. Thanks for coming. I know we're getting to the end of the year. It's hard to find time. So we do appreciate you continuing to join us and have a lovely Friday and a lovely weekend. And hopefully we'll see you Monday. Bye. Thanks, everyone. See ya.